to today's seminar, the fifth in a, the series, Starting a Food Co-op, What You Need to Know. Today's seminar is called Preliminary Store Design, presented by P.J. Hoffman. We'll be offering an opportunity for you to ask questions today. Um, you will type your question into the question box, which is located in the toolbar on the right side of the screen. During the question and answer periods, I will announce you by name and put you on the air so you can ask your own question. If you would first uh, introduce yourself and tell us which co-op you're from and what your role is there, and then go ahead with your question. Um, and in the meantime, let's get started. Uh, PJ Hoffman is our store designer, works with CDS Consulting Co-op and United Natural Foods. Uh, PJ, you want to take it away? Well, thank you, Marilyn. You're very kind. I hope everybody there is sitting comfortably and uh, your mind is relatively nimble. We're going to cover quite a bit of territory in a short period of time. I've asked uh, Bill Gessner um, of CDS Consulting Co-op to, uh, to also join me and to make some additional information and ask me a few pointed questions here and there. But I certainly welcome your questions as we go along as well. I just want to give you a little bit of background. Uh, I have been with CDS and CDS Consulting Co-op for about eight years now, and I've been in my current job with UNFI and its predecessor, Blooming Prairie, a cooperative wholesale, for the last 23 years. Prior to that, I spent uh, 17 years working retail, uh, starting in supermarkets in 1968. So I tried to approach my design work from a retailer's point of view, and that's a, real, that's a different point of view than, say, an architect's point of view. And uh, here's the agenda that I had in mind, uh, that we would um, uh, talk with Bill just a little bit about, a, about the timeline and the schedule for um, and the phases and stages of a typical store project. And then I'd go on to uh, go ahead and uh, look at a prospective site from a designer's point of view. You might have a place in mind. You might have signed a lease. Well, it's how I look at these kind of things. We'll give, I'll give you an overview of, um, of store design, and then we'll focus a little bit more on preliminary design. And part of any store design, actually it's a very, very strong part, is the store equipment component. So we'll spend a few minutes on that. There'll be time for more questions and discussion, and finally we will wrap up. So moving ahead, I'm going to ask Bill, if Bill, could you uh, quickly explain uh, this, uh, the three stages of, uh, of this type of project? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, PJ. <clears throat> uh, some of you may have seen this slide before. It's been used in other webinars, but it, it shows the three typical stages of a startup food co-op project. And to establish some context for the webinar today, I just wanted to comment. Uh, the focus of the webinar today is on preliminary store design. And that work typically would happen in stage two, um, in stage 2A or 2B, when the feasibility work is being done to uh, determine whether a proposed project is feasible or not. Uh, feasibility work consists, in my view, of four components. There's market feasibility work. There's financial feasibility work. There's internal readiness work. Uh, internal readiness or capacity, and then there is design feasibility. And so looking at the feasibility of your project through each of those four windows and then eventually integrating them all together for one overall assessment of feasibility. Um, and then so the design work happens in two, two stages, the way I think of it. There's preliminary design work that happens in stage two and then the dotted line that you see there represents a, uh, an agreement that is signed when you have a project, when you secure a site with contingencies. And then you go into stage 3 or 3A, where you do the more complete design work. And stage 3A culminates when you have all your financing together, all your design work done, and you are ready. You are essentially the final decision point of whether to proceed or go ahead with your with your project. Uh, once you cross over that solid line, there's no no turning back. So thinking of the design work, the first preliminary design being in stage two, and the more complete design work being in stage 3A. 
So I'm just wanting to establish that context. Well, thank you, Bill. So what is a preliminary fixture plan? I'll explain a little bit more what goes into a fixture plan. But the idea of a preliminary plan in phase the, the, the whoop, let's go back there. What was it? Stage two. There we got it. Stage two is that what we want to do in the feasibility and planning stage is to show whether or not the project is going to be right for you, what it's going to cost, what it will look like. And if you don't do this ahead of time, you might be sorely surprised later. But it, what, it, what a floor plan would do is give, give you key features, such as do you want a deli? Do you want a sitting down, sit down area? How many checkouts would there be? Where would receiving be? And so on. We also, in a preliminary plan, want to make sure that these components of your new store are in roughly the right size and in the right sequence. Um, you wouldn't start out with toilet paper, for example. That's probably not a good idea, although people have tried. The, we also want to illustrate both to you but possible um, sources of capital what kind of store um, is going to be developed so that they have a picture of it as well. The second part of this is, these, and this is perhaps the more important actually, is you want to understand how much it's going to cost for you to develop your new store. And believe me, it's always more than you think. I call them my scary numbers. And those numbers are really in three major categories. There's a fourth, which is like a catch-all. But the three major categories is the cost of getting the site, the building, ready for your occupancy, the cost of getting the buying and installing all of the store equipment, and finally, stocking your shelves. And we can, on the basis of a preliminary fixture plan, get you very close to those costs. And then you can understand whether you have a $200,000 project, a $1.3 million project, or in the case of most of you, a $10 million project. That was a joke. I can hear you laughing. From, from a design point of view, uh, I'm, I'm just, I just play a small part in, actually, in, in all that it takes to open up a new store and a new co-op. And already, you should have done some market research work, perhaps uh, working with Debbie Swasuna of CDSCC. And that, what that does is it gives you an idea uh, with a prospective site what your sales are going to be and whether or not that site really is the best for you. And, um, and that is often called location, which is the second thing. So that is, is the location the right location for you? That's something, as a designer, I don't, I mean, I care about, but it's not something I involve myself with. I'm going to assume, as a designer, that you have done your homework, you've engaged professional people to help decide that this is, in fact, your location. But I do look at it in terms of a site and what are its capabilities. And one of the main things that I look at is the size and shape. And I want to say very clearly that um, the right size doesn't mean that it is a good place for you. Because a 3,000 square foot or 10,000 square feet can have very different meaning. I like saying that all square feet are not created equal. And the ideal um, shape of a store is roughly a rectangle that is, has a 2 to 3 ratio. A typical 7-Eleven, for example, is 2,400 square feet. And that would be uh, 40 by 60. And large supermarkets often will choose that as a um, as an ideal of 100 by 150 or whatever. Uh, old buildings that are long and narrow or are very shallow from front to back create a design problem. There's other things that I look at um, in, uh, in a prospective site. Um, as far as the facility goes, I look at the relationship of the entries to the trucks and receiving. They should be far apart from each other. The relationship of all of this to the parking whether or not you're on a hill and what happens to the shopping carts and, the, and how the grading meets the front entryway or the rear loading area, unloading area. I would look at the mechanicals. Um, very often a prospective site has, might, might have a 200 amp service and you, you might need 8 or 900 amps depending on the size of the store. Uh, mechanicals also include plumbing and HVAC. 
we would look at the general condition of the building. What would it take to bring up to uh, the standard that you need to have to operate your business and look good doing it? Finally, uh, not finally, but there are obstacles. I even worked with a store that had a chimney right in the middle of the store. But there's columns. There's all kinds of stuff that can get in the way. Floors need to be um, even strong, um, whether it's wood or concrete. Concrete is by far the most common floor that we work with. Ceiling height, depending on the size of the store, should be adequate not only to feel comfortable, but also to, to have mechanicals hanging from the ceiling and signage and lighting. So it needs to be high enough so it doesn't feel crowded. We would look at whether there's a potential use of upper or lower levels, basements or mezzanines or second stories. And windows. We love windows, but we hate them. Uh, windows are great for people and lousy for groceries. So windows can be an issue. And finally, and I can tell you a horror story of this, but we don't have time, um, the, the site needs to be free of hazardous materials. Store design. If you ever, and I'm sure you've all been, have favorite stores, and, um, and you walk in, and it, it feels right, and it's easy to shop in. Um, even when you look at a floor plan that looks like a really great floor plan, it all looks simple. Uh, but it isn't really. And the process, certainly, to getting to that beautiful simplicity is not a simple process. This is very involved. And anybody who has tried um, moving, getting a, um, what, a graph paper and sketching your own floor plan and then trying to do it yourself will realize that um, it's multi-dimensional and there are so many things to take in consideration. And uh, well, when I work, I work with a lot of different stores. When I work with really small stores, I'm talking about 1,000 square feet, I'll say, you don't need my design work, but you need my advice. But anything over 1,000 square feet, you start having the need for professional design. And as you get into much larger formats, 5,000, 10,000, 30, 40,000, uh, the design team and the amount of expertise that goes into it and all the complexities get compounded. So the most simple store that you know and love or that you might have imagined for your own co-op is not a simple proposition in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the days of, of barrels on a wooden floor and uh, for, for bulk goods are, are long, long over. And uh, secondly, um, I, I like saying, you can see it's in quotes, that when I put things in quotes, they say, I like saying, good design is expensive, bad design costs forever, and that is if you take time, get the right people, and spend time and spend money on the design up front, the results will be very, very good, assuming the implementation is there and the basic concept of your store is there. But design, good design produces results bad design gets in the way of your achieving your goals. So it's like other things that you would want to spend up front on. It's, it's a great investment for the success of your store to do get uh, good designers in there. This includes architects and some other people I'll go through a little bit later. Secondly, or thirdly rather, you'll see it says bones, organs, and skin. And that's just a, a way of saying that there's three parts to the design. There's the structural design, whether it's new construction or, or within four walls that already exist. But the building, if you can imagine the building being the bones, the structure, it's, it's great, it's necessary, it starts defining your space, but it isn't the store. And the organs are all the things that make your grocery store a grocery store, that make it function. That's what I call the organs. Um, it's the, the functionality of And finally, the skin is how it looks. And you can equate interior design and decor as being a key component to the skin. Uh, my time uh, as a designer, I spend more time on the organs. And that is, as, as a store planner and design, I'm more concerned that everybody have a great time um, in the store and that it function optimally. So I'm more fo focused on the, on the workings, of the inner workings of the store and, the re and the, all the work it's going to do versus the building and the skin, but as an overall designer, I'm concerned about all three. What I focus on is the store layout. And if you ever hear the word fixture plan, which is very common in, in my field, it really means the store layout. So it includes things that aren't the fixtures. It includes walls, bathrooms, and what have you. It's called a fixture plan because store design is 
inside-out design. It's, it's basically every, all, it's all about space use. It's what happens where and what equipment is where. And that's why it's, it's called a fixture plan, because it emanates out. We don't, we don't say, OK, we've got this space. Uh, let's figure out the fixtures. Uh, what we do is we say, we need to do this and this and that. How do we do it within the space? Finally, I'm a great fan of interior design. It is the thing that gives the store, more than anything else, gives the store its character. It's not something I do directly, but interior design is, is the coloration. It's the flooring, the lighting. It's the sounds. It's all that stuff. And uh, you can go into one store that has the same format as the next, the same fixture plan as another one, and it can feel very, very different. And you won't even recognize it's the same, same format if, in fact, the interior design is, is done differently. I'm a big fan of interior design. I wish you were talented enough to do it, but maybe in another life. So here's what I was talking about. Many of your stores might be quite small. But some of the new co-ops have been up to 15, 20,000 square feet. The bigger your store, the more you need to have professional people and the more of them they're going to be. And I'm just going to go very briefly through some of the basic functions of design and, just, and show you who, who is responsible and who contributes. Someone's going to have to decide what goes on. And that is someone's going to have to decide whether you need a 24-foot dairy case or a 36 foot. Someone's going to have to say yay or nay to whether you want one kind of lighting or another. And someone's going to have to keep the whole design team running and functioning and performing. And that would be design coordination or the design coordinator. And primarily, that's your representative. Somebody representing the co-op will be doing the design coordination. And if it's a big project that employs an architect, and most projects I've worked on do have an architect, they will have a very specific support function in helping you do design coordination. That is also a typical role of an architect. Site plan development. We work with a lot of stores that either it's, a, it's an empty piece of land or it needs significant redoing in the front of the store or around the store. That site plan development, the primary person involved would be an architect, but I, as a store planner, will often contribute because I understand the functionality of the store a lot better than a typical architect, including trash and recycling, trucks, and oh, just all kinds of good stuff that has to do with store operations. For the floor plan or fixture plan, it's not the architect. And this is a mistake that many stores uh, make because they, they hire an architect and they say, uh, Let's, you, do the, you do the fixture plan, the floor plan. Well, architects, as a category, there are some exceptions. Architects are not equipped, are not skilled, and don't have the experience doing a fixture plan. So that's why the store planner is put first. We are, the pers a person in my role is usually the lead designer, in fact, usually the only person who touches the floor plan or fixture plan. That work is given to the architect and is contributed to all the other design disciplines as well. And here's a really, really important one. I'm going to touch on this later when I talk about store programs. But merchandising and operations planning. I mean, this is, I, mean I can put in, I can put all kinds of stuff, but does it reflect what is going to happen within the store? And um, a good example might be cheese. Are you just going to have a, a, a few pieces of cheese that are wrapped outside of your store? Are you going to be doing cheese cutting? Are you going to do a cheese cutting and specialty cheese program that is almost like a a theater type of thing where someone's out in the open entertaining people and taking questions and um, doing active selling of the latest uh, organic cheese. Those are all the things that have to do with merchandising and the operations are all the support. Backroom support, but some on the floor. All the support that helps the merchandising. So if your store, or your, sometimes this is general manager, your store would be uh, the main key in deciding those merchandising programs I would contribute as a store planner. You may bring in consultants. I advise it. You may work with your wholesaler. It's a complicated thing. It's very, very important to tackle um, your design from a merchandising point of view. The building plans are basically architects and engineers so that um, they don't fall down and uh, the building uh, 
um, is warm and humidity free or has low humidity and it looks good from the outside. Construction estimating, very important in a preliminary plan. Um, very often it will be a general contractor who will take a plan and say, if that's what you want to do, this is pretty much what it's going to cost. And they can itemize like the heck too. The architect, often a large architect firm, will have estimating capabilities. Or they may turn to a contractor, but your architect too could be the person doing or the group doing the construction estimating. And it's easy to underestimate construction. I want to emphasize this. Almost every project I've been involved in, and I've been involved in hundreds, but for the past five or six years, what's gone over budget has been nothing else but construction, and it's gone way over. So you really want to do your construction estimating very carefully. And uh, not just use your cousin Joe to give you a, a round, round number. Equipment estimating, uh, that's something we do out of our office. Uh, we often get a lot of help from the store. Interior design, that is, that is a, a separately licensed um, discipline, and there are interior designers that operate um, separate from architects, but often architecture firms have interior design capabilities. So that would be the team, and again, the bigger your project, the more people you have. Sometimes there's as many as 25 contributing planners and designers to a project. Make it 26. I can exaggerate if I need to. But the whole idea is to create a great store that generates sales and that is efficient in, in its operations. So when I look at what great, because my focus is on the store layout, the fixture plan, what makes it really good? For me, I look at it, we want to sell a lot of products, so I want people to be able to get from place to place. They understand the format. If they're by the cereals, they can find the milk. If they're by the milk, they can find the soy. And it's just real easy to find. And they don't get lost. They know where the checkouts are. They, um, it's, everything's clued in. It's intuitive. It's simple enough. Um, there are store plans, and I've done them, that, are, are, that intentionally confuse people. It's a good angled wall will do that and I'm notorious for some of those. And there are, there are ways and there's reasons for uh, making navigation not so great, uh, but in general, uh, you want to keep your format very, very simple and easy to understand. And this includes the navigation of product through your store, not just people. You want to have fluid traffic flow. Um, I'm, I'm not totally against pinch points, but you really want to under, understand in your format where people are going to be at any one time and what they're going to be doing, and is there going to be a problem with those people being there. It's, uh, very often, uh, I will separate out what we call demand, demand areas of the store, separate them out to different corners of the store so that people aren't crowded um, in all in one spot. Conducive merchandising, and uh, this is another big discussion, but what this means is merchandising that sells itself. Your product is easy to find. The people are drawn to areas um, that, that offer a special deals or attractive products. Uh, it, it's kind of, it, it's logic, but at the same time, it's, it's artwork. If they, and uh, just uh, one, of the, one of the main um, components of conducive merchandising is tie-ins, and that is the relationship of one product category to another. Efficient operations, I can take out in, in a store plan, I can take out 4 or 5 percent of, of potential costs. And it's not simply in the steps and the movement of people or how things are prepared and, or stored in a back room, but it's also in the, um, the mechanical side, and that is the amount of electrical being used or the amount of uh, heating and air conditioning. All of this stuff is uh, addressed in efficient operations. We want the customers to feel served and not left alone, but that depends on your labor budget. Something I try to do is look at your business plan and your projections and plan accordingly. If you've got a 17% labor budget, uh, we're not going to have a lot of service areas, for example. But we do want to make sure that customers are feeling served, particularly if your store is going to be a, a natural organic store or store with that needs to dispense a lot of information, 
we want to make sure that that information and the people are there where they need to be. Codes, building codes, ADA codes, um, NSF, which is a, a food safety code. We always want to make sure that the codes are complied with in a store layout. And finally, uh, we do want to make sure your store looks like no other store um, in the world. Uh, it doesn't mean it has to be dramatically different, but it has to have your look and your sap similar to how your face looks very distinctive on top of your skull. And I'm sure it looks just great. Um, my page in turn. Oh, there we go. I I'm always looking for um, I'm always looking for the shopping experience, optimizing that. My job is to help you sell groceries. Everything else comes secondary. Uh, you, you're going to pay your bills. You're going to have wealth to share with your members. You're going to be able to do all kinds of things. If we can enhance the shopping experience and get a ton of people in there who just love spending their money, even though some of your products might be a little a high price for their taste, but they just love it. So uh, shopping experience is foremost, and that's what I concentrate on. I'm very concerned with the work experience and all the, and labor efficiencies, but I'm less concerned. I, I'd rather um, have the I, I think there's more financial gain in the shopping experience. I want to make sure that every square foot, however strange it might be, I want to make sure that every square foot is earning its way and that the mechanicals are optimized. Now, I did work with a store in Florida, a private store, that went ahead and optimized all its mechanicals. What that means is all the sinks were lined up in one row and all the refrigeration lined up in one row. And believe me, it was a stupid store. You don't do the mechanical optimization uh, simply for its own benefit. It, that goal becomes mixed in with the other goals. Whoops, sorry. Jumped ahead of myself. Oh, I'm so agile. Supplemental goals. Now, sometimes these things seem to be like at the foremost in some projects I've been involved in. But really, in my mind, they're not. They're great things to do, but they're not what you're all about. And those supplemental goals, however important, are green design and being a community center. Those are supplemental goals because those themselves don't create the business. Those themselves don't create the wealth for your store. They support, they can support the mission and the goals of your store. But they, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't design a store around green design first. Uh, you wouldn't be able to afford it. Finally, um, if I'm often asked um, in four plan priorities, what should be the retail and backroom ratio? It depends uh, where you are. In New York City, there's almost no back rooms. But in most places that I work with, by the time you put in all of the back room things that people say they want and need, perhaps even including a classroom, that uh, comes out to about 60% of your space being retail and 40% being uh, back room space. Now, Am I comfortable with that? No, I think it's a little, it should be more like 70, 65, 35. But when everything is taken into consideration, that's often what it is. Let's turn the page. Uh, store programs. I borrowed this from architecture. I don't know if there's any architects uh, uh, listening, but thank you very much. Uh, pro architects talk about programs, and I borrowed that concept. I think it's very good. It's, it's what you do and what you offer, and that is um, everything is a program. Even, even customers getting uh, shopping carts out to their, uh, or their products through shopping carts or whatever, out to their cars, that's a program. A program could be um, taking, taking cash out of a till when there's more than $300 in a, um, in a till at the cash register because that program would include not only labor planning to do that, but also software for your POS system and include the program of a drop safe, and it has to be near the cash area, and that probably requires a front end office. So you can kind of see that programs, both merchandising and operational programs, are, are the key to designing a store. The second is the definition of what you're offering to your store. Uh, most of the co-ops are, in fact, uh, primarily natural organic. They might want some specialty items like uh, olives from, uh, from wide variety uh, parts of Italy or whatever, and they might mix in some conventional. I worked uh, with one co-op that was primarily conventional. But these are your three, three basic options. Um, many of the new co-ops will, will focus, again, on natural organic, 
which is why I put that first. But understanding what your product line is and who you're marketing it to is key to my uh, work um, as a store designer. Product categories, grouping, and sequences relates very much to, uh, to, the, mer to the merchandising. It, it, that's exactly what it is. But what are the product categories that, that, um, that you're going to have in your store and what size? Are you going to be concentrating on allergy-free products? And uh, that would mean a, a larger household section. Would you uh, want to have a large gluten-free section? Um, would you, uh, would you, how about bulk? How much bulk do you want to carry and why? And then the, not only the grouping, um, but there's subgroups within the groups, and then there's the sequence. And I don't, you know, nobody, not even Bill Gessner would expect you to be thinking about all this stuff as at the very beginning of designing your store, uh, except in very general, what are you carrying and who are you serving is a, is a very basic uh, concept. And then store plan just takes it from there and makes it more detailed. I've learned, too, looking at number four there, that when I design stores, some parts of your store um, are, you know, just kind of happen very quickly. doesn't mean they're not important to you. They just simply aren't as complicated. The areas that I find us stumbling over and needing a lot of thought is any kind of food service, deli, or any kind of meat, and bulk, as simple as it might seem at the outset, bulk is not simple to plan or to, or to fixture. And uh, so the programs for these elements need to be carefully defined ahead of the final fixture plan, for sure. Uh, PJ? Yes. A question for you on that. <clears throat> in, the, in the preliminary design, how, you know, how detailed do you want these programs to be defined, or is, is the preliminary design more just to see is this particular site going to be suitable for what you want to do in a broader way? In a much broader way, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that, uh, that in a preliminary design, we're not really concerned whether you have 12, foot, 12 feet of chips or 200 linear feet of grocery altogether. But we do want to make sure in the preliminary design that if you say you want to have a small deli with a seating area, that it is properly represented in the drawing. Does that help? Yeah. So you, so you begin to see the bigger picture, whether, whether the concept you have for your store, whether it can fit into this, whether the site you're looking at will work for the concept you have. Exactly right. But, the, but, but similarly, you need to, uh, I mean, the, the people who would define the product mix in your store need to, need to understand the, some of the uh, complexities and some of the detail of the products. Right. And it, it, with the preliminary design, oftentimes the <clears throat> general manager isn't even in place for a startup co-op. So a lot of these things haven't been thought through. And so it seems that part of the function of the preliminary design is to get these questions out on the table, sketch them in there roughly, and then by the time you get to the more complete final design, there will be more thought have been given to this. Oh, I think that's absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. PJ, uh, another yeah. question right now that, that kind of is on the same subject from Dean, if you wouldn't mind um, taking it as well. No, def definitely go ahead. Quite well. Uh, Dean, I've, uh, I've unmuted your computer, so if you would introduce yourself and ask PJ your question. Sure. Uh, my name is Dean. I, uh, I'm involved with a startup uh, co-op in the Fargo, North Dakota, Moorhead, Minnesota area. And uh, it seems like I have more questions uh, every time I sit in on one of these webinars. I, I am, I guess, curious. Uh, we're trying to budget uh, for all these various studies that we need. And uh, if you have an idea, it's kind of a, a, a two-part uh, question. First of all, uh, how would we coordinate this market study with the preliminary store design? According to the uh, webinar that Susan gave, uh, I believe that, no, De excuse me, uh, Deb uh, gave, uh, she said that we should have one to three sites chosen for a market study. Well, what if those sites are, 
uh, that are chosen won't work from a preliminary store design standpoint. How do we know which to put first, the store design or, or the market study for the site selection? And then the question being, I already know what a market study will cost us. How much would a preliminary store design cost us? Okay. Well, two questions in one. That's uh, challenging for me. Um, the, in terms of budgeting, how to coordinate um, a market study to preliminary plans, particularly when you have multiple sites. Uh, as I mentioned before, Dean, uh, that uh, if, if you do, if a co-op has a site that they are um, they're really interested in, um, contacting me or a store planner and say, do you see anything from your perspective? that we need to consider in that. And it could be that the market survey might have already mentioned parking, but may, we may see some things about the building itself that may be helpful or unhelpful to you. Um, I think that we should get going with preliminary designs only when, and there's always exception to this, but only when uh, your co-op or any co-op is focusing on a specific site, not multiple, uh, not multiple sites. Uh, so that would, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, if, you, if you're real hot to trot about the site and the market survey says that it supports it and the market survey says your store should have these components in order to do um, such and such a sale at this particular site, then what, as a store planner, I've got what I need. I've got a site. I've got um, a market survey which says if you put in a meat department, you will do such and such a sale. It gives me some information. Now, the cost of a preliminary plan depends on the size of the store. And um, it's really uh, the way that I price. And most, um, most designers price by the square foot. Uh, but a preliminary plan, and I price it low. I must confess, I price it low because I know preliminary plans end up not being used. They're just there as an example. But a preliminary plan for a mod modest sized store might cost you two or three or four thousand dollars. And it's hard to say because um, a 40,000 square foot store would be significantly more. But for a, like a 6,000 square foot total store, PJ? Oh, yeah, 2,000 two or so. But no, it all depends. If, if we're putting in a kitchen and bakery, it's going to be more than that. I, 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 there's one way to look at this uh, design cost issue is that that by and large, uh, as a whole process, you're going to have to pay a certain amount for design. And it's going to be all your designers, not just a, what it would cost to have somebody like me do this work. And it's often said that, um, or stated, that your design would be uh, between 8 and 10% of your construction costs. Now, that doesn't help you on preliminary design because you haven't defined what your construction costs are. But it's not uncommon for a 6,000 square foot store to have design costs overall of, say, twenty or $30,000. And uh, so, you know, again, it depends what's going on in the store. Every project is very different. A turnkey situation is very different than a store uh, building that needs to be gutted completely before, uh, before it's rebuilt. So it's hard, to, Dean, I don't know how to answer that, um, except that um, your preliminary design work is small bucks compared to what you end up paying out uh, at other times. So, so as a follow-up question, I guess, or maybe to clarify more uh, what I asked initially, then the cost, you know, the cost is one thing that we can work with that. But to make sure that we're doing the procedure right, we've we've worked we've been working with a realtor here in Fargo, and he's selected many. Uh, sites for us, uh, we're trying to winnow this down to three sites that we think would serve us best term in terms of where we think the market would be best served in terms of arterial access and all of this to try and be this regional co-op that was discussed in the uh, in the site selection webinar. And so uh, other than contacting you and saying, okay, we've got these three sites, or, or, or a store planner, we've got these three sites, or should any of them be discarded out of hand? Is that the process? And if, if they pass that just cursory inspection, then do the market study, and then have the store planner come in after that? Is that what I'm hearing you say the way we should do this? Uh, yes. 
Yes, you, you definitely should be focused on a specific site before you hire a store planner to develop a preliminary plan. I will say again, though, that before you do that, you can send me, info or somebody doing my job, information about each site, even before you decide to focus on one, and get my perspective on which one. I won't look at it from a geographical point of view. I won't look at it from a demographical or market centrality point of view. I'll simply look at it. Does this look like a facility that will work for you? OK, thanks. OK. Ready to move ahead, then? Yes, PJ. Thank you. OK. So OK. Uh, we, moving on, I'm going to just go, just, you can just basically read that. Um, all it says is that there is a process. A floor plan does not happen all at once. There is a design process that we use, and these eight steps are pretty much pretty much it. Um, if somebody has any questions about this, uh, send me an email. I'd be glad to do my best with it. But I don't want to take time explaining each one of these right now. I'd rather show you some fixture plans. And there we are. I, these colors are especially for you. I hope you enjoy them. But I mentioned before the, here, um, we're going to, if you take a look at the fixture plan development, the first, uh, first word, the thing that we do is uh, we present space use options. That's number three on that slide. So if you look at this plan, this is actually um, a relocation of a co-op in North Carolina. Here is a building. And here is a space use plan. This is not a fixture plan. It simply says, if we have an entryway here and an exit there, and we, we have a loading in the back, and here's the building, what happens where? And you can see that um, in this plan, I hope you can, that people are entering on the right-hand side. They encounter produce and a customer service counter first, and they wrap around. The last thing they see in the perimeter um, is a deli area. And finally, they're at the checkouts. And this, was a, this is just a concept. Do you want to have? the checkouts where they're shown. What would happen to the traffic flow? What would people see if we had this laid out? Uh, very briefly, to understand the colors, the green is produce. The brown is bulk. Back there in kind of a greenish blue is beer and wine, not allowed or wanted in some stores. The, the light brown is grocery. You'll see some purple in the middle of the store. Uh, that's vitamins and body care. The yellow on the back wall is dairy and refrigerated. The reddish thing over in the corner is meat and seafood. Uh, blue is frozen, and the deli is an orange type of thing. But there's one space use plan for, a, for this one possible site. Here's the same site with a different format. And all we're doing is we're saying, what if we did this? Some plans look better than others. This is saying, OK, we know there's going to be a little park up to the north where those trees are showing. What if we put windows and seating by the park and just switch the, the floor plan around? What would happen? So we're integrating outdoor seating with this park area. And, and you can see what happens. It becomes what we call a left-handed store, where the produce is immediately to the left. You curl around. Instead of the deli being the last thing, it's the third thing on the perimeter. And you can see how it all kinds of lays out. Instead of the bulk being on a wall on the perimeter, it's in islands in the middle, which has its pros and cons. And then we said, well, what would happen if we stick the same building? We did something different. And this particular building, this particular plan, separates out, this is the only one that does it, separates out the traffic flow from the deli shoppers and the grocery shoppers. So the grocery shoppers would enter on the left-hand side and start working with produce and curl around, and their last stop would be the deli. And you can see the orange on the right-hand side. That's the deli. The deli shoppers would come in, and they might be in a huff and a hurry to get back to, get back to work after lunch or whatever they're doing. But they can quickly uh, shop the deli, uh, maybe sit down, and get out. And so the, this was a format that began experimenting with that. And uh, the co-op chose that one, A. Ah. They didn't ask me, but uh, it was a, uh, I mean, they asked me, but you know, 
a choice has to be made, and we, they, they chose A. But that gives you an example that these, these plans, no matter how they simple they seem when, you, when they're put together, uh, take a lot of consideration. And that's the first step in a preliminary design is these, what we call um, color block space use programs. Now here's another store. This is a co-op in, in Tennessee that is thinking of relocating. And uh, it's a combination of an existing building with, a, with new construction. And I'm just going to show you one of the space use plans, because it'll show you how we go from a color block space use plan to uh, one that is a more detailed preliminary plan. And this is an actual submitted preliminary plan. And I, wish, I wish you could see the lines better. I can, it's rather dim. But I'm going to show you the difference again. There's the space use. And this actually shows walls and doors and tables and actual checkouts and actual fixtures. And it's so detailed, even though it will change. If, if this store goes ahead with this format, it will change many, many times over. This preliminary plan looks like a store that could be built. It's got all the right elements. It's got the produce on the right-hand side, some pro dry produce islands that goes into bulk. I mean, to my eye, this is a nice store. But by the and this is the type of plan. It shows all the coolers, all the sinks, everything. This is the kind of plan we would develop as a preliminary plan. Again, we, once you decide to do your project, after this has been costed out, we may want to um, decrease the cost of the project or add some new features or, or redesign certain parts of it. Maybe the deli doesn't flow right or we got a better idea. We can massage this plan but the basic plan usually still stands as a preliminary plan. When we do the final plan, I'll just let you know, it is far more detailed and there's a lot more documentation that goes on the actual drawing. But there is a preliminary plan for you. Any more uh, questions about uh, the design side? Because I want to spend just a few minutes, a few minutes on, the, uh, on the equipment side, because that seems to be a major issue for, for these stores. Yes, there is a question, okay. PJ. I'm going to ask it for Jamie because there appears to be some background noise there. Okay. The, uh, the question is, would uh, product-related decisions fall to the store planner to inform the co-op organizers? No. There, there's, there's going to be, uh, in my mind, there's going to be some kind of food policy that uh, ought to be in place uh, before you uh, before you go too far, I'm not sure exactly what point, but you should be defining what kind of store you are and whether or not there's going to be any restrictions on the type of product that you're going to carry. Um, and you should have a general idea of, of what, what departments and what features you want to have. And that's really, that's really what I need to know. Could you repeat the question again? Uh, would product-related decisions fall to the store planner to inform the co-op organizers? And again, uh, my, my goal as a store planner, or my, my job is not to inform, but to simply demonstrate through design the intentions of the co-op. Okay. Uh, which is interesting. I, I, you know, as, even though I find my, I, I do give advice. It, it's rare, but I, I do it in a lot of different ways. What I'll often say is, as a designer, well, you say you want this, but have you thought about that? Or have you checked with another store? And I might give the, the name and number of a store. They had such a, a, a salad bar. You might want to check with them to see how it worked. There's, I can bring the experience of many, many stores and 40 years of being in the business. I can bring that experience to bear, and I do. But I don't really make decisions, uh, and I, I, I shouldn't make decisions for the co-op. Okay, thank you, PJ. Jamie, if that didn't quite answer your question, you can uh, type in something in addition, or anyone else for that matter. Thanks, PJ. You're welcome. If equipment procurement, and that is on that, that preliminary plan you saw, is a whole bunch of equipment. There's lots of equipment that, um, did I skip this? Oh, yep, I did. Never mind, we'll go to mechanicals. Uh, one of the big surprises in store planning or opening up your co-op is what I call the hidden giant. And that's, ref that's refrigeration, electrical, plumbing, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. It is the mechanical side of your store. This is very complex, and it's very expensive. 
And so it's a hidden giant because, for the most part, once it's in there, it's in the walls, it's in the ceiling, you don't see it. It is a major, major consideration. I mentioned before that what's going, what's coming in over budget consistently, and I mean way over budget, has been the construction side. Well, it's the mechanical side within the construction that is the real culprit. So it's the hidden giant. The plumbing, ventilation, air conditioning, um, really, again, uh, that, that is part of the, the, um, the hidden giant. I will sp spend just a moment on refrigeration. I'm going to call it 101. Very big deal. You're going to have to make a choice between self-contained refrigeration and remoted refrigeration. You might remember um, that refrigeration is simply taking heat from one place and putting it someplace else. We're taking heat out of your cases, out of your walk-ins, and we're putting it someplace else. And uh, a self-contained uh, refrigerated unit is like a little refrigerator or freezer that has the compressor inside the cabinet like your, like your home refrigerator. Uh, this is very expensive. There's certainly a use for it. But in general, we want to have the compressors and condensers someplace else because then the heat and the noise that's generated um, is issued elsewhere. But refrigeration um, is a very complicated thing, and particularly when you get into environmental concerns and energy efficiency and a, a larger store, it takes a lot of work and a lot of engineering to define your refrigeration system. Now on to, since we only have a few more minutes, the equipment list is a preliminary equipment list that comes from a preliminary plan, like the one I showed you for that store in, in Tennessee. And that is, we've got equipment shown on the plan, and we can assume that there's going to be other equipment that's not shown, like a, a cash register or a POS system is not shown on the plan, but we, we know we're going to have to have it. An equipment list, a preliminary equipment list, takes all of the possible or potential equipment that's going to be in your store and gives it an estimated cost. And that way, you can know whether or not um, this is all going to be affordable to you, along with all the other costs. The, when we go into a more final plan, the equipment list becomes much more exact, and we start putting in specific models and numbers and actual prices. So an equipment list is one of these great tools that you would have in developing your co-op. And it's often initiated by the store planner. It's what we do as part of our job. How much should your equipment cost? Bill Gessner, for one, gives you very, very good going in numbers. But as you get more specific to exactly what's in your store, that's when, um, that's when you, you start saying, OK, Bill is giving us a great number, but we're coming in above. Now, if we, if we come in below, that's a problem, too. Why are we coming in below? Because you don't want to undercut your equipment budget. It's a, it'd be like uh, buying a car without wheels. It just uh, won't go anywhere. And uh, so you really want to be concerned um, if your budget doesn't start looking like uh, the, the budgets of other stores of your type in general. Now that there are differences, and there are differences, but um, how much should the equipment cost? Start with a general number. And uh, I've heard a whole bunch of them, but I'll, I'll tell you, um, if I were to if I were to work with all the stores, if I were to boil it down and work with all the stores that I've worked with over the years, big store and large store, in today's dollars, it's, it's often around $80 a square foot. It sounds like a big number. And again, you can come under that. You can go over it. It depends on whether you have a kitchen. It depends on the complexity of your floor plan, how condensed it is, whether you're just there's a whole bunch of things in there. But that's the kind of number that somebody like Bill would would give you that would be probably a little closer to, to the reality of your particular project. So I, I certainly need to defer to, uh, to Bill Gessner on that kind of number. But I just, uh, I just want to emphasize that if you think that you can go in cheaply, you're going to put a cheap product out for your, before your public, or, or it's going to cost you later on. I uh, sold a whole bunch of, uh, well, I didn't sell. There's a whole bunch of used equipment that went into a store. And about a year and a half later, the manager called me and he said, guess what, PJ? I'm busy buying that equipment again. It simply didn't last. It wasn't appropriate for the job. Nothing but trouble. 
new versus used. Um, certainly, if you um, are short on capital, um, there is a role for used um, equipment. But I want to say that um, there, there should be, if you do your financial planning, planning right, there should be a, um, a very limited role for used equipment. Again, it's not held in high regard as being um, the way to go. And the way to look at it is there's the initial cost of your equipment, and then there's the cost of having the equipment. And the cost of having used equipment is often much, much greater than new, including all costs. Also, when you buy equipment, uh, you have a choice. And this should be determined very early on, uh, right after you get into uh, past your preliminary stage, is how are you going to be buying equipment? Are you going to do it yourself? Are you going to work with local companies? You're going to work with a large procurement service. UNFI does have a procurement service, but it isn't necessarily the right uh, service or the right model for you. I would say don't try doing it yourself. Uh, go with the, the latter, too. And uh, don't look for equipment before you have a floor plan. Certainly don't buy equipment before you have a floor plan. Yikes, what a terrible circumstance. Uh, I'll focus a little bit more on equipment. How does new or good equipment put, put money on your bottom line? By having the right equipment appropriate to the task and functioning optimally, we, it will actually increase your sales. It will look better. It will sell more product. And we have, we've replaced frozen food cases within the same store, and sales go up 30% in frozen. Why? Because the lighting's far better, because it looks better. And it's just frozen foods. Imagine what you do with other departments, like bulk. The other part is the, on your bottom line is not only does, it, does the right equipment increase your revenue, but it decreases your expenses. expenses. And it decreases utilities, decreases the labor. There, it uh, decreases the possibility of workers' comp claims, insurance claims. It lowers your cost of maintaining the equipment and it delays the, uh, the time that you need to replace that equipment. And all of this is money on your bottom line once you start operating. Finally, uh, before we get into uh, any kind of last moment questions, I just want to just show you a few more formats. Uh, this is the Veroca Food Co-op, which was a startup co-op 15 years ago and recently moved into this location. But this is a, uh, you can, I won't describe every uh, part of it, but it, you can see that floor plans, I'm just going to go switch back between these two for a moment, floor plans can look and act very, very different. The second one is a private store in Virginia that sells primarily vitamins. You'll see that there's a lack of refrigeration. There's no produce department. But this is a legitimate format for certain types of stores. There are many successful stores like Roca Co-op who have a little bit of grocery and a little bit of vitamins and emphasize a lot of fresh foods around the perimeter and a seating area and a deli. And this next one, which really, yeah, there's a little bit of dairy, a little bit of frozen, and a juice bar, but it's almost all shelving. And this is a much less expensive store to, um, to operate. And actually, their margins are higher. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Here's another one. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is the Outpost, a, a well-established co-op in Milwaukee. It's been around for many, many, many years. They have three stores. This one has simply said, well, here's an example of fresh first. And this is always an option for larger stores. You put your fresh products and all your fresh and food and perishable foods departments first. And um, what you do is you maximize sales. You look like a marketplace. You look distinct because anybody, everybody carries, gro carries groceries. It looks like everybody else but this can really define your store. But there's some real drawbacks to this plan. I talked about distribution of shoppers. At any one time in this plan, I can guarantee you, and I didn't even talk with Pam about this directly, I can guarantee you that at any one time, uh, two-thirds of the shoppers are in the first half of the store. And that the, shopping, the shoppers get disinterested, and they simply don't get to the far wall. So there's advantages and disadvantages to every fixture plan. Nothing's perfect. And I think that's it. Any final questions, or uh, do you want to make a comment? Uh, yes, we have one more question I think we can fit in, Bernadette. Uh, 
Bernadette's question, PJ, was uh, was your $80 square foot just for equipment cost or was it also for uh, installation? It's all of the costs related to your store equipment. It includes installation. That's correct. Your biggest installation number will be your refrigeration installation. That is often a huge number. But there's other installation costs. It also includes uh, systems such as audio systems and security systems and communications and, uh, and computer systems that don't you, sometimes people don't think of as being a store equipment. It includes office furniture. It includes the, the deli seating if you have chairs and tables there or stools. So it, it goes all the way to the, to the pencils that people would write to their, their PLU numbers for bulk. It's everything, all the equipment needed for the operation of your store. Okay, thank you, PJ. Um, if you have any additional questions that we didn't get to or you think of later, uh, PJ's email address is right there. He'd be happy to address them. Uh, today's materials and a recording of the session will be available on our website, cdsconsulting.coop, and it will be in the news and events section of cdsconsulting.coop. There will be an evaluation shortly. Uh, please take a few minutes to give us your feedback, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Um, there's about four or five questions that will really help us understand uh, if we're serving your needs and how we can get you the information you need for starting a food co-op. We have one more session in this series. It will be two weeks from today, hiring and guiding a project or general manager. It will be with Bill Gessner and Carolee Coulter. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Thank you, PJ. Thank you, Bill, for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.